We dealt with cars in the Central European Eastern Bloc countries last time. Now let's focus on trains and railways, on the situation from late 1940s forward. Let's talk about the importance of railways, what role did they play, what challenges they faced and what conditions were they in, together with other things. Welcome everyone to this new episode of Altengrad City in City Skylines. While I'll be talking about all that, a new train station will be built in the time-lapse. We will return to that new residential district past the industrial zone, which happens to have railways running on the side. So a perfect spot for a new station for both local and intercity passenger traffic, as well as a new train yard for cargo. Let's go build it. The entire Central European region already had extensive railway networks at the start of the 20th century, inherited from the old states and empires, which of course created the backbone of the economy and personal travel. This can be illustrated by even today's numbers of railway lengths relative to the country's area, basically density of railways, where, for example, the Czech Republic is eighth from all countries and city-states across the globe, right behind Switzerland. Germany is 10th, Hungary 12th, Slovakia 13th, and Poland 19th. But uh, that is the today's numbers, but apparently Poland peaked in 1954 with around 30% more railways, and Germany, for example, with 40%, although I don't know the year. So that is basically the starting point of the whole railway situation. Lots of existing railways everywhere. But since railway was also a very strategic asset during the Second World War, it became the focus of raids, attacks or sabotage, and it was also intentionally destroyed by the retreating armies. So after the Second World War, if a certain region was somehow touched by the war, it would usually be, at the very least, at the railway infrastructure. So damaged or destroyed stations, bridges, rail yards, uh, factory railways or just railways in the open. The rolling stock was also targeted. The war's political aftermath also created difficult situations for certain regions, like East Germany, which had to provide significant war reparations to the Soviet Union. The Soviets dismantled and took away around 5,000 kilometers of rails, 700 steam locomotives and some electric locomotives, together with the catenaries and other electric hardware. Some of the locomotives were later returned in the 50s, but in various conditions. Poland also had parts of its railways dismantled and moved further into the central Soviet Union, still during the war. And the new regions in the west had some railways also dismantled and taken away. Most of these smaller lines were never repaired. Despite the initial situation, railways were so incredibly important that huge effort was made to do the most important repairs very quickly and even restart production of locomotives by the end of 1945 in some places. The railway companies were already mostly nationalized before the war, so the communist takeovers did not change that too much, although certain reorganizations happened, like centralizations and merges. Now, what about the rolling stock? Steam locomotives were still dominating the numbers in the late 1940s, although there were already some electrified tracks all around the region, even before the war. Countries wanted to continue the trend of upgrading railways with electric wires, but the process would prove to be too expensive. And there was a big shortage of any locomotives to accommodate the huge industrialization, which proved to be too pressing to focus on infrastructure investments instead. So new steam locomotives were produced and they still played key roles in especially cargo transport during the 1950s and even 1960s. That doesn't mean electrification of railways wasn't done at all during these times, it was just done slowly. I found an interesting piece of an old article from the 1960s that basically outlined how railway companies put themselves in a corner with operating the expensive to run and maintain steam locomotives and older wagons. So not enough money was available for investments into cheaper rolling stock to save money in the long run. But that would mean that right now there would need to be lower transport capacity before the investments could bear fruit. And that was very much a political issue related to prioritizing the industrial output. 
although it should be noted that the new post-war steam locomotives were significantly improved over the old ones and offered better efficiencies, speeds and power. There are some interesting statistics for the percentages of locomotive types. So, for example, in East Germany in 1965 there were 88% of steam locomotives, 9% electric and only 3% diesel. In Hungary in 1965, so we compare the same years, Hungarians operated some 70% steam, 10% uh, electric and 20% diesel. Then in 1973, so you know, just 8 years, not a long time, East Germany dropped steam to only 33% and increased electric to 16 and diesel to 51. Hungary in the same year had roughly the same percentage between all three types. We can assume that the situations, or at least the trends, would be similar in other countries of the region. Also, those are just numbers of vehicles, but apparently the steam locomotives were used less and less, so the actual work or transported load was unequally done more by the diesels and electrics. Speaking of modern locomotives, the countries of the region could continue with various traditions of building local vehicles and not just locomotives, but also diesel and electric multiple units for passengers. So similar to cars, there were many types of locally made vehicles, but significant numbers were also cross exported between the socialist countries. More on that later. For the electric locomotives, there was a problem with choosing the electric parameters of the newly electrified railways. There are many technical and economic advantages, disadvantages, as well as historical reasons for the different systems. So, for example, East Germany decided to stick with the 15 kV AC system already established in West Germany, Switzerland and Austria before the war. Hungary, which already had a great tradition of advances in electric trains, chose the 16 kV AC system but soon switched to the 25 kV AC that is the most popular today. Poland eventually ended up with the older 3 kV DC, uh, same as Czechoslovakia initially, but experts and officials could not agree on future expansions, so the country was split between the older 3 kV DC and newer 25 kV AC systems, just like in Hungary. Although some sources state that it was a political decision, so that Czechoslovakia would eventually need to make dual power locomotives so that the Soviets could buy them. Everything is fine with these multiple systems until they meet. This was initially solved by simply approaching a station or a rail yard with both networks so that the train could be exchanged between two locomotives for the different systems, although that is very time consuming. During the 1970s, new locomotives that could operate between the systems were made, so that simplified things a lot. There obviously still needed to be a physical separation of the two wire networks, but the train would simply lower the power collector, continue on inertia and extend it back once it cleared the gap. That is still done today. All the Central European Eastern Bloc countries made their own electric locomotives for various power systems, various needs, but there were also some export versions to the other socialist countries and the rest of the world, including the West. By 1970, Poland electrified 17% of its network, Hungary 10%, but East Germany 11% by 1979. But the percentages don't really say much as it takes into consideration the entire network with tracks that would not even be considered for electrification. The main tracks, capital cities and large industrial regions, big junctions had priority of course. So looking at old pictures of main stations might give us an idea that every track everywhere was already electric, but not really. The switch towards electric power was desired, but as outlined above it continued slowly. Diesel locomotives needed to step in to replace the steam locomotives and serve as the transition option and to operate on less important tracks where electrification was not even planned. We can see on the example of Hungary that in 1975 there were 50% of diesels, which was also the peak. It then dropped to around 30% in 1990. This trend can also be seen in other countries and it makes sense. During the gradual phasing out of steams in the late 1960s, the oil prices were not a problem and operating diesels instead of steams was fine, which partially played a role in the slower electrification. 
This changed after the 1970s oil crisis, which did not affect the Eastern Bloc countries as harshly as the West, but it nevertheless changed the oil situation for the future and led to gradually increasing prices of the Soviet oil. The Eastern Bloc countries were also not blind to the overall world development, so decisions were made to increase the electrification efforts. On the case of diesel locomotives, we can also touch the subject of the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, a CMEA or Comic-Con. It was an organization that was theoretically supposed to deal with trading between the socialist countries, uh, unifying certain standards and norms, and overall economic integration with the control from the Soviet Union. It attempted to create some sort of a master central planning that would bound all the member countries, but it never came close to that as countries opposed the idea. But some centralized elements on some levels were established. For example, the specialization of production between countries. It meant that some product types would only be made in one place. In this particular case of diesel locomotives, the member countries were not to produce their own very heavy diesel locomotives of around 2000 horsepower, except the Soviet Union and Romania. Uh, similar partitions were established with other products with varying degrees of success. The Soviet Union would export in very large numbers locomotives such as the M62 into all of the Central European countries, then the 130 classes to East Germany, which would become the most numerous diesel locomotive there, and East Germany would also receive the class 119 from Romania. All of these three types are available for city skylines, surprisingly, so the M62 we already have since it was available in 1960s, and the rest we will add later. Countries, of course, didn't just use these very heavy diesels, but also many, many more models in lower power and weight classes that were mostly made domestically with some cross exports or license builds. What about the conditions of railways and overall what was its status? We already outlined that railways were very important economically, but also just generally important. This is nothing particularly new or specific only to the communist times. Railways were important throughout history, which is illustrated by the large grand looking station buildings, but also by the large area they took in cities, cutting through blocks, changing street layouts and so on. The modern post-war times did not change that, but rather continued that. There were many new station buildings built around the region using very modern design trends of the time and expensive materials or techniques. There are also various examples of artistic decorations in the new stations and so on and so on. Cargo railways were much more important than passenger transport though. When plans were made regarding the capacity of some tracks, cargo would receive priority, so cutting the passenger service, decreasing frequency and so on. In some cases, tracks would only be reserved for cargo and passenger operation would be replaced by buses entirely. Perhaps that is partially the reason why railway speed was not exactly focused on. In certain regions this was simply inherited from the very old 19th century railways that were built with parameters not allowing high speeds and investments were not made to change that. Just to illustrate how much was cargo transport prioritized, for example East Germany at some point had double the transported weight compared to West Germany which had double the railway length. Another example can be the history of Poland's central main line or line number four, which is a new track finished in 1977 with 224 kilometers length. It was planned and built with geometric parameters allowing theoretical speed of up to 250 km an hour. But in 1980 there were only 4 passenger trains compared to 73 cargo trains going on it daily. And it wasn't until 1984 when the first express trains started to use it going 140 km an hour. This speed was raised all the way in the end of the communist era in 1988 to 160, which was something very rare in the whole region. Overall the maximum speeds on other tracks and in other countries were around 120 to 130 km an hour, which is more than enough for cargo and that's only counting the few more important corridors. There were also relatively small numbers of vehicles that could exceed those speeds. 
Train design was somewhat rationalized to fit the railway conditions. Only the more prestigious international or domestic express lines received the top of the line fast modern vehicles. But the average speeds outside the main corridors, but also even on them in some places, were much lower due to worse and worse track conditions, having to wait in stations because of single tracks only, that was very common still, and because of lacking modern safety control systems. The western trend of closing tracks was also present here, but it depended on the region. It overall ties to the ideas of rationalizing the railway transport to get rid of unprofitable lines and upgrade the more important ones. This is very similar to the 1960s development in the UK with the so-called beaching cuts. Hungary apparently closed the most tracks around the same time, but other countries as well. And similarly to the UK, the economic benefits were questionable. But overall, during the communist times, not that many tracks were closed. Poland, for example, lost only 8% of track length between the 1954 peak and 1988. The rest of the closures happened after the revolution. New tracks were built, but it was not that common and not even that necessary since the main lines were already established between cities and even the industrial regions more or less remained where they were. But of course, new lines were built for new industry, new factories, and they also had to be moved in case of open pit mining of coal or various water related projects. And some main lines received more tracks. So that's about it for the introduction to trains. Uh, just like with cars, there are a couple of places in the city where we will do some more upgrades. So plenty of opportunities to add some more info or go into more details with something else. But now let's see what's being made in the time lapse. All right, so we are in that new district. I already mentioned that in the beginning and we are building a new train station together with like a small train yard for the cargo trains. And also we are doing some kind of industrial buildings around the new station simply to just fill the space and create something slightly more interesting. So you can see that the station building is, uh, is something rather unique, right? And it is an actual building from the workshop. Uh, it's again one of the one of the assets that I made for the Alton Grad series. I know, I know, I said uh, with the prefabs that it's going to be like a one time thing, but uh, I don't know, I just couldn't help it. I really wanted to have this particular train station in the city. It uh, again took uh, way longer than I first anticipated, so I'm probably going to uh, not touch Blender for half a year again, and uh, you know that I'm just going to forget about it probably and uh, do something do something again after that time. So anyway, this train station is from uh, Havirov in Czech Republic. It's a train station built in the in the late 50s, uh, again in that uh, like a Brussels style that I already introduced with that first prefab area. And um, uh, recently it uh, actually saw some renovations. It looks slightly different today in real life. Uh, I kind of dare say worse a little bit, but uh, well, it is what it is. At least they did not demolish it, which was also the original plan. But anyway, uh, I made it so that it would resemble somewhat the original looks, even though like cleaner looks, because uh, for the past uh, decades it was looking really, really scuffed. But uh, here in Antengrad, we are just going to have this kind of a version. I did not bother making it exactly as it is in real life, because in real life the station is elevated, so that you are entering the station building uh, basically below the platforms. So that makes things very easy to then enter the platforms uh, from below. So when you are entering that big glass building uh, from the center, then uh, you're just going to go through it directly into the tunnel below the platforms. But here in Altengrad, I already knew that I would like to place it in here. And this place is completely flat. I was thinking of maybe doing some landscaping, but it would look just kind of stupid because uh, as you can also see, I made this station so that it's directly in the center of that avenue that goes uh, from that big square in the center of this new residential area. And it really needs to be like visible right there. So if there was like a some kind of a like a big gap, uh, you know, vertically, it would just be kind of stupid. So I really had to make this station flat, as you can see over here. So we need to do something different for the approach to the platforms. And uh, well, we have to do a bridge. Fortunately, these days, this is super easy. As you can see, I'm just using these pedestrian paths, uh, exactly the same one 
that I used for the conveyor belts in uh, some of the factories previously, although this time I'm using it so that uh, it's going to be completely covered, right, with this kind of a, a corrugated metal or something like that. So it's not the nicest looking approach to the platforms, but uh, it's perfectly functional and uh, it took uh, just a couple of minutes really to put it together in the game, so that's quite welcome as well. Now, for the industrial areas around the station. So, I took some inspiration from various train stations around the region, and I decided that we are going to include a couple of, um, like, warehouses, let's say, around the station itself, like, uh, around the station building, and uh, then we are going to do just a couple of industrial buildings around the entire area, because... Uh, when you look at from when you look at from above at this region, uh, it's not exactly like scaled properly. I would say, for example, the industrial zone is just a little bit smaller. I think so. I really wanted to just expand the industry, and it's not like super heavy industry in this place. But um, yeah, like I said, some kind of warehouses or light manufacturing, something like that. And um, as I also said, I just took some inspiration from the real life stations around the region, which also had some kind of these uh, factories. It obviously makes sense if you are going to build some kind of a train station, train yard, then, uh, you know, putting some warehouses here and there uh, on some of those uh, like dead end tracks for unloading some cargo. It definitely makes sense. I'm also doing some kind of a, like a bus station because we already had a line just circling around the new residential area, but it was just going on these kinds of small streets and it did not really have good looking uh, stops. It was just kind of circling around weirdly. So are like turning into the small streets. So I made uh, a bus stop right in front of this building, which, you know, makes sense. We really do want to have these uh, options for transportation connected. And uh, then I'm just creating this like a, first and foremost like a turnaround area for the buses so they can turn around and re return back to that factory place. And uh, together with that there's like a little parking spot for the buses mostly and like you know a couple of cars. So this bus line that I'm doing in here, that's probably going to be the most important bus line uh, for connecting this train station to the factory, right? So if there are some kind of passengers that are traveling from uh, some distance, then they can just board the buses and easily reach the factory, which is obviously the most important connection. The residential area is not that far, so there doesn't really need to be any kind of connection. People can just walk there. So this is actually like a project, a train related project that I did after a really long time in Altengrad. And I was not exactly sure what are the, let's say, latest trends in making these kinds of places. So uh, I already had these, for example, catenaries, network catenaries. So that made things uh, really, really easy because I could just string these uh, along the entire train yard. I was looking at some uh, train yards, I believe for this particular place in Dresden, because there are the same, you know, catenaries. These are the German catenaries made by Revo, if I'm not mistaken. So I just took a, took a look at the spacing, you know, measured the spacing and did it so it looks uh, roughly similar. Uh, at first I was trying to use something different made with PO, but um, that would have been just a lot more work. So I really wanted to just uh, do these and kind of be done with it, you know. Uh, I don't think that I put uh, wires over the entire area. I'm not exactly sure right now. I think that, for example, the train yard area probably uh, doesn't have all the tracks with wires. But to be completely honest, I'm not super sure right now. Uh, we definitely don't have wires uh, on tracks going into the factory place, uh, into the, all, the, all the stations there and everything. So there would definitely need to be steam or diesel locomotives, uh, you know, just uh, shunting the shunting the trains into the factory, into this train yard. So maybe that's the reason for the train yard to be there, not just like a, you know, parking spot for all the wagons, but also for just uh, pulling the vehicles out of the factory and uh, making it available for the, for the more beefier locomotives to continue. Right, so as part of this project, I also wanted to return to the downtown into the main train station and do some kind of expansion in there. So that's exactly what we are going to be doing in here. Now, the main, the main train station, as you can see, only had a couple of platforms and it wasn't really that big. But uh, since we, you know, since we have more trains now moving on the tracks and uh, the overall trains just became a little bit more important, we are also going to 
have to do some kind of changes uh, in this regard. Now, there are going to be a couple more changes, of course, to the rail infrastructure around the city as we progress in time, but it's going to be like a gradual change. I don't really want to do like a massive uh, like a refurbishment of uh, some of these stations until we reach some uh, later times and it's going to be really, really critical to do some sort of a major refurbishment. So in here, I'm just going to be adding uh, these platforms over here, which is already a big, big, big problem because uh, there is the train yard, of course, there is that turntable for the steam trains. So there really, really isn't that much space. And on this side, I, for example, wanted to create like a little dead end platform for some of the smaller trains that are uh, that are going from that um, like a southern area of the city, you know, the small one with the exhibition center and all that, so that uh, it's only going to be intended for the small, uh, short, like, uh, you know, short distance commuter uh, trains or something like that. So they don't need to take up space on the main platforms. This is, you know, something that's done on various stations around the region, so why not include it over here? And I'm mostly including it so that the entire station is uh, looking a little bit uh, crowded, you know, with the platforms and everything, and it's looking like uh, we are really running out of space and uh, the station is kind of at the peak capacity so that uh, when we are going to reach the modern times eventually we will really have a big motivation to do some major change to the entire configuration or the entire layout of the station basically so that we can increase the capacity make it a little bit more efficient with uh, how the trains bypass each other and all these kinds of things. So this little block that I had to get rid of, I just, uh, you know, put this like a control tower in there and uh, did some small details uh, around it, but nothing, nothing all that crazy. Uh, right now in the 1960s, we obviously don't want to get rid of, for example, the turntable for the steam trains or the sheds just yet. But as I explained with those, you know, percentages, uh, the steam locomotives are eventually going to be phased out and not very important. So even the facilities for them are kind of going to be subject to change because, well, they're not going to be that needed. Well, so this is the finished cinematics, the transition. As you can see, the new station and some kind of the industry around it took uh, took some reasonable uh, area, which is what I was aiming for, I suppose, to just complete this uh, new district. It's uh, not built right next to the new district. There is like a green belt uh, dividing the residential areas from the train station, which, you know, makes sense. And it's just creating like a nicer scenery, I suppose or, you know, things like that. Uh, no particular plans for that area just now, but uh, this works fine in this in this uh, time. Uh, so this is the train station building. As you can see, I also did some sort of uh, tile surface in front of it, which, you know, looks okay. Then some sort of planters, which are similar in real life like that, although in real life there are like stairs into the stations and some kind of a ramp, but like I explained before, I wanted to do it uh, on flat ground because of, uh, well, because of the landscaping that we already had. And this is exactly what I was mentioning, that uh, like central uh, geometry of the station. So uh, at least the main building of the station, obviously there is that uh, building at the back, which is creating like an asymmetrical thing, asymmetrical look and... Uh, well, actually, the main glass building also is a little bit asymmetrical because of the position of the clock and uh, the, like a little roof over that entrance. But that's kind of nice, you know, this asymmetry in otherwise like general symmetrical look. Uh, I don't know why I like it. I just kind of do. Uh, there are lots of trains uh, moving on, on this uh, train station because it's kind of like a junction as well, if you think about it. Uh, right past the train station, there is that uh, switch or like a split one trains, uh, one one side of the tracks, so the main corridor basically goes into that terminus station, into the old town, and uh, trains that are going to turn, uh, well, left basically from the station are eventually going to end up at the main station right here, going going to go on the viaduct, kind of bypass, uh, you know, reach the elevation, and uh, eventually end up right here. Uh, so yeah, just a couple of expansions in here, just a couple of new platforms. It really helps like gameplay wise as well, the train traffic. Also in the time lapse, you could have seen, uh, I really struggled with some uh, 
some of the pathing for the for the for the tracks for the lines because they were kind of crossing each other and all that all all of those things so uh, yeah I had to I had to repair that and eventually we did increase the capacity also gameplay wise so you know that's nice. Anyway, that is going to be all for today's Altengrad episode. Thank you so much for watching it. If you liked it, then please do all the algorithm things below the video, the clicking, writing, and all these kinds of things. And big thanks to the channel members who decided to directly support what I do here on this channel. I really appreciate it. All right, that's going to be all. Take care and goodbye.